So welcome everyone. We are at the end of this second week together. And let's start with the usual kickoff in which we will see the what, the why, and what you will be able to achieve by the end of the day. So what are we gonna see today? Today, I think it will be one of the most important lectures and one, uh, one of the lectures that will empower you the most because you will be able to do amazing things out of it. So first and foremost, what will be the first topic? So we will start to use JavaScript together with the DOM, the document object model. So we're gonna start using JavaScript to modify what the user will actually see and the behavior to expect from the page. So we're gonna see how to modify the DOM and of course, how to react to events. So we will see how we can uh, use JavaScript to trigger action or function as we defined them last week. Why do we need this? Well, because that now that we know the basics of JS, we want to use it in a real life context. And using the DOM manipulation, we can create dynamic websites, sites that change in behavior and uh, uh, look and feel depending on who is the user, depending on the action of the user and so on and so forth. And of course, using events, we can intercept user action and respond um, accordingly. So when the user press enter, we can send a message into the chat. When the user click on a specific book, we can open up a model window that shows the details of that specific book and so on and so forth. So at the end of the day, you will be able to modify every piece of the page as you like it as a runtime through JavaScript. And you will be able to intercept the most important event. Of course, as you will see, there is a plenty of events that you can intercept and the list is growing day after day. Of course, once you know how to handle three, four most famous, the other one is just to read, read a page of documentation and you're good to go in, in a few minutes. So before moving forward, before starting the new, uh, the new topics, let's just recap what we've seen last time, since we put a lot of things on the table. So first and foremost, let me just take my boilerplate here. As you can see, it's like we just have some, an index HTML5, in which we have just the normal boilerplate, let's say the one that we have seen, in which we have the head, in which we have the metadata and the body in which we will include the content of our page. We know that we can insert JavaScript in three ways in our page. We can actually put it into the HTML code directly uh, re related to events like on click, for instance, but we will see this better later. We can use the script tag to add some code into the page, like on solid log, whatever. But the most important, uh, the most important way of using it is to import an external file, exactly as we have seen for uh, for CSS that we were able to put in line styling, the style tag in the head, or import an external file. As always, since we're using a file in the same folder, we don't need to specify any specific path. In case it would have been in a subfolder, we would have had to add also the relative path that will lead us to that specific folder. The first thing that we have seen in JavaScript is the concept of a variable. The variable, you can imagine it as a label box, so a box with a name on it, in which you can store information. The way that we have to declare a variable is by using the let keyword. So let x equal 10 will put the value 10 inside of that variable. We can reassign those variables how many times that we like. And the content of the variable can also be the result of an operation. Like, I don't know, if we want to create epsilon equal 20, we can then create another variable total to be equal to x plus epsilon. The operation in JavaScript are the, the one that you expect to be. So the sum with the plus, the minus with the minus. Uh, oh yeah, sure, sorry, let me zoom in a bit. Okay, I hope it's better like this. And the uh, module operator and so on and so forth. 
We have seen in JavaScript that inside a variable, we can store different kinds of, of objects. We can have numbers, we can have strings that are words put together, phrases, okay? Characters, something like let name equal Diego, something like this. But not only that, in JavaScript, we can store inside a variable also function that are, you remember the example of the post-it, a list of operations that the computer can do, or we can have arrays that if the variable is a box, the array is a shelf in which we have for each position into the array, a different value in it. And of course, we have also the object that are composite variable in which we can have some key value paired of variable nested within. To make an example, we can have let, I don't know, oh wait. Let, for instance, array be equal to, I don't know, as you can see, it could be a list of elements that could be also not uniform. So we can have merged together strings and uh, a number. Nobody will prevent that. It's not a strongly typed language, as we mentioned uh, before. Or we can create an object like let student be equal to an object in which we have this key value paired inside, like name equal, I don't know, Alessia, since she is here, and email Alessia at strive.school, and maybe some other information like, I don't know, uh, courses. That could be an array, for instance, like Ignite and full stack and so on and so forth, okay? So as you can see, the, the object is super flexible and we can at any time then access those properties navigating with the dot, as you can see uh, here, Visual Studio Code is helping me out um, writing my code so I can access to name, email, courses, etc. And I can also add new property just by, you know, uh, write them down straight here, like surname and so on and so forth. To delete properties, we can just use the delete keyword. So delete student.email. And this will remove the property from the object. So the object will be like this, without this property. Another thing that we spent some time on that was super and is super important is the concept of function. A function is um, a chunk of an algorithm. It's super important because it allows you to reuse a piece of code that you can use over and over. And because it, uh, it allows you to divide your code in chunks with a specific operation in it. A function can be defined in two ways, with the function keyword or with the arrow function syntax. Uh, in this case, we will use the function syntax in which we use the function keyword, the name of the function, like for instance, I don't know, um, example. Between parentheses, we can specify the list of parameters the function is expecting to receive that will be separated by commas like n1, n2, and will be the input of this function. And then of course we can execute, we can add every line that we like, like console log n1, uh, I don't know, uh, let x equal to n1 plus n2, and then return x, something like this. And with the return, we are currently returning the value from the function. So if we create a new variable here that we will call like let final result be equal to example of n of uh, 20 and 50, the result will be that the, the value that we are returning here, so the sum of the two values will be then stored inside the final result. Apart from this, we have seen other two super important topics. We've seen the selection uh, done through if else statement that allow us to fork our code depending to some condition in it. For instance, if we want to, I don't know, uh, create a function that we can call um, absolute number. Okay, this function will receive a number and it will do something very simple. It will calculate the absolute of it. So if we are receiving something like 50, it will return 50. If we receive something like minus 20, it will return 20. 
How can we do this? It's pretty straightforward. Using the if else clause, we can just do something like if number is greater or equal than zero, we can just return number. Let me just add some brackets here. Else, we will return minus number. Okay. As asked in the chat, to run a function, we need to invoke the function using the parentheses. So for instance, if I copy this function to my Google Chrome, for instance, uh, where was it? Here we go. And I go to inspect my page in order to have my console, I can definitely just, oh, please don't do this. Oh, thank you. So here we can define our function absolute number and to test it out, I can just invoke it with absolute number and the number I want to pass it like 50 that returns 50 and absolute number of minus 100 that will return 100, as simple as that. Apart from if else statement that we, that we introduce, we introduce another super important concept that are the loops. The loops allows you to perform the same operator, the same operation over and over. So the body of the loop will be executed a number of times that you will decide thanks to your code. This is usually very helpful used in conjunction with the arrays because we can execute the same operation for every element that we have in the collection. An example of this could be by having this array that we created here to, for instance, calculate the, let me just remove myself from here. Let me just calculate the total of the array. So we can define our function total that will receive nothing since the array is it's globally scoped, but let's put it as example that we receive something like, let's call collection. And what we can do here is to define the, the sum to be equal to starting by zero, and we can iterate on the array, for instance, using a four, that will have the initialization of i equals zero, i less than array dot length, i plus plus. The code that we have between the brackets, brackets will be executed the number of time needed for this condition to be valid. So the first run will see the value of i equals zero. The second time i will be one and so on and so forth until this condition is false, okay? So what we can do here is to say that sum will be equal to array of i. So the first time we will place, oh, plus uh, uh, equals sum plus array of i. The first time array of zero, we know that arrays index starts from zero. So we will put 10 into this. The second time we already have 10 in it and therefore we will add 20 and then we will add one. To return the value to the caller, we can just return sum. Okay, since uh, Loom asked, we will go through the assignment during the break, okay? Okay. So let me just comment out this code because we don't really need it. And let's start from the lecture of the day. Now that we revise some of these concepts, it's time to see how can we use them in a real life scenario, okay? So first and foremost, we have to introduce this object that is provided by the browser that is called document. Document uh, allow us to access the DOM, providing as a variable called document that refers to the document object model. The document object contains our DOM and the prototype methods that allow us to access elements of the DOM and manipulate them. It's our gateway to access our HTML basically, okay? So thanks to this document object, we will be able to mess with our HTML code. So you can consider it like a reference to the content of the page. And um, we can do it through selectors. There is this 
that are old school that I will introduce first, that are, for instance, get element by ID that returns a reference of a DOM element with a specified ID. Let's see how it works. Let's create an element in our page and we know how to put the ID. So here we can just create our element. So mm -mm -mm, let's call it div ID equal, let's put it as test. And as a content, I will just add some random text. If we open our page, we will see that we have the div there. If I, let me zoom in a little, okay. If I do document dot get element by ID and I set as ID test, I will get a reference to this element. What does it mean? It's like having a remote controller to this element. We have something that allow us to command and to control that specific piece of the page, okay? As you can see, this is the representation we can store this reference inside the variable, like let uh, test um, reference equal to document get element by ID test. Why do we need this and what can we do with this? We can do literally everything. Once we have the command of, it's like having a voodoo doll of that specific element, okay? You can do whatever you want with it. So for instance, if we do something like test reference, dot inner text equal ignite. As you can see, we replaced the content of that specific element all in a sudden. If we want to, I don't know, change the style of it, we can just say, okay, cool, test reference dot style dot color will be red. And as you can see, the, con the color of this changes immediately. And we can also add classes, remove classes. We can make it disappear like style display. As you know, from the lectures with Stefano, this will make it disappear. Will it delete it? No, it's just disappear. Since I still have the reference, I still have control over it. So if I put it back with this normal display block, the element will reappear again. Okay, so the reference is super important. Now that we know how to get them by ID, as you might imagine, we can get them in several ways. In the very same way in which we can get them by ID, there is another method to get them by class name. So we can just do document.getElements, the S here is super important, by class name, and then specify the name of the class there. Please remember the big difference between ID and classes. When we talk about ID, we suppose that we will always have a single element with that specific, uh, with that specific ID. For what concern classes, on the other end, we are always supposing that we can have more than one DOM element with that given class. And therefore, the result of get elements by class name, it's not a single reference, but is an array containing references. Okay, so let me just build an example around this. So imagine here that we have uh, an ordered list in which we have some li with class, let's call it um, list item, something like this. This will be one, and let me just copy and paste it over and over. Awesome, one, two, three, four, five, cool. Now that we have this, we can just go back to our page and select them through document, get um, elements by class name. And here we can specify list item. As you can see, the system is giving us back a collection, an array with five elements in it. One, two, three, four, five, okay? But still, it is an array. So I cannot do something like, let me store it like let uh, list items will be equal to this piece of code. So I'm saving them into this variable. 
I can't do something like list items dot style dot color equal red because I'm not applying the style to an element, but I'm trying to apply the style to an array and an array doesn't know how to behave at that point, okay? So to apply the style and to perform this operation, the best way of doing it is just simply, since this is an array, looping through the array. So for let i equals zero, i less than uh, list items dot length, i plus plus. And here into the body of the array, I can, for each one of them, perform my operation like list items of i dot style dot color equal red. And as you can see, now the element has this property assigned. Of course, all the modification that I'm doing are made on the, do on the current version of the DOM. If I reload the page for any reason, I lose everything. I'm just modifying the current rendered version of the page. I'm not modifying the HTML file, file you save on your R drive, okay? And then, of course, like we're used from CSS, we have a method for accessing the element by ID. We have a method to access the element by class name. And of course, we also have a method to get the element by tag name. So get the element by tag name, as simple as you might imagine, it works exactly as the same way of the others. The only difference is that here, we're specifying not a class, not an ID, but a class, but a tag name, like P, div, or in our case, li. Let me go back here, document, get elements by tag name. And here we go. If I set li, as you can see, I'm receiving back this list of list item with five elements in it, okay? But there is also a new way of doing this. So if for some example, like get element by ID, is better to use the let's say old queries uh, the old get element by id for some other example it's simpler to use these new selectors you can access uh, through the very same selector that you use in css so with document.query selector you can use for instance hash test id and it will return the reference to the dom element just to remind you, hash goes for IDs. So this will be exactly the same as document get element by ID test ID. While query selector all is made for selecting multiple elements. And here, for instance, with dot subtitle, we will get all the elements with class subtitle. And the cool thing here is that you can use also multiple selectors. So if you have a special hierarchy that you want to use in your application, or if you have a specific um, selector that you are already using in your CSS and you, know, and you know that that works, you can just use it here and you will be sure that you're targeting the right element on the page. But let's see this in practice. So let's try the very same example we did before. So document dot query selector hash test as you can see is giving us back that very same element so we can just in a text this works and as you can see this changed immediately on the other end if we need to do something like something that selects several element we have to use the document query selector all and in this case for instance we can search for all the list items okay and as you can see the result is exactly what we expect to receive awesome if you have any question please just stop me the two methods are two valid alternatives this one is the most modern version let's say to do it it's in my opinion, more readable and more flexible since you can compose uh, qu more complicated query, like for instance, I don't know, 
only under the UL, the LI with a specific with a specific class name and so on and so forth. So I prefer this method, but please mind that in some cases it's better to use get element by ID for performance reason. Awesome. So let's move on. Now we know how to get the reference of this element. Let's see how now we can read elements uh, attributes. So we can access DOM element attributes thanks to their attribute name. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. So suppose that we have an image in our, in our, in our page, we can just console log the source to access to the source or use, since this is an object, the square bracket notation. Oh, wait a second. Is the all bit necessary for classes? Okay. So to answer to Anthony, the question is, is the all bit necessary for all classes? No, but if you want to access more than one element, you need to put it there. If you want to get just the first result, you use query selector. If you want to get all the elements with that specific uh, class or tag name, you, you need to use query selector all. Can you select an element in if it's not specified in CSS? Of course you can. Uh, let me just show you. So how can I specify one element that is not specified in CSS? We can just target it with, um, with the tag name. So document query selector diff. Oh wait, parenthesis. As you can see, we're selecting the first element, this div, even if it's not specified in CSS. So the selectors and ID, classes, etc., are just giving you an extra helpful uh, name for that element that you can use to refer to it. But of course, you can also refer to it in a less specific way, okay? It's just, when you have the DOM, it's like having a menu of a restaurant, okay? In which you have different section. In some restaurants, you have a number clo close to the, to, the, to the dish that you might want to order. It's like going to the waiter and give him more direction. So in some case, you can just tell him something like, hey, from the drink section, the third element, and this might be your definition of a, a diet coke okay while in some other case you can just go straight ahead and use the id so the number next to the dish it will be number 78 and they will know that is i don't know pasta carbonara or whatever okay but still the menu is the same it's just another way to refer of the element on it what if you have to use multiple div but the query selector no, it doesn't give you an error. Nice question. So if I use query selector for the LIs, that in this case, for instance, as you, as you can see, are more than ones, it will just give me the first one, okay? So it's not giving me an error. And what happens if I'm trying to access to something that is not on my page? So if I look for an image and I don't have any image here, it will just give me back a null element. So it's not able to find an element on the page. And if I search with query selector all, the result will not be null, but will be an empty array. So, sorry, dude, I cannot find any element. So I'm giving you back an empty list. Any question on this? Okay, awesome. So, as we were mentioning, we can also access to all the properties thanks to the name. Like for instance, if I use this uh, query selector here, let me see if this works. And I specify a classes special case. Let's suppose that we adding here into my page, some extra properties. Like for instance, I'm adding an image source equal we don't have an image in this moment. I will search one later. So let me just test.jpg and alt equal, this will be an image, I promise.
In my page, I will see the placeholder. Since the image is not available, I will see the alt. And of course, I can access to this image. So let my image will be equal to document query selector EMG. I'm getting a reference, my image, and I can access to both the properties source and alt by simply using their name. Uh, how can we select other elements after the first with query selector? Well, usually you don't you don't do it. You just use query selector all, and then you just go to the second position. So if I want to access to the second element in this list, what I will do is document query selector all of LIs. Okay, and then I will access to the second element or to the third or fourth element or to the last element or to the third element and so on and so forth. Okay, remember that query selector alls returns you a node list that is a sort of uh, fancy version of an array. And therefore, you are able to access all the elements based on the index they have inside of that array. Okay, does it make sense? Cool. Okay. So let's move on to the next topic. We, we know how to access element. We know how to modify their properties. What's next? Of course, as we can read these elements attribute, we can also write elements attribute. Okay. So for instance, if I'm selecting these, uh, this picture with this query selector, I can then change the URL of the picture I have in it. And uh, of course we can do it with the name of it or we can use the set attribute method. Let's make an example. Let me search for Harry Potter book cover. I will need two URLs. So I can just take the first one, Sorcerer's Stone, copy image address, and I will add it here to my source. Let me see if this works. Let me go back here. Okay, as you can see here, I have my big cover for Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Okay, but now I realize that maybe I'm going to the US market and therefore it's called and the Philosopher's Stone or was it the other way around? Let me search for Philosopher's Stone. Cool. So this is supposed to be the cover. So I can just copy it. Copy uh, uh, image address should be it. How can I set it with JavaScript? I can just go document query selector. Let me just store it. Let HP cover equal document query selector image and HP cover dot source could be set as this new URL. And as you can see, it immediately, it immediately load the new picture and present it into the page. And this should create some wow effect at this point. Because I mean, we just change immediately an image on our page with just one line of code, just by changing this property. And we will use tricks like this over and over to create dynamic web pages. And of course, source is just one example. You can change most of the properties that we have in uh, most of the attributes that we have in our DOM tags this way, okay? So you have just to use the right name. Could be height, could be width, could be source, could be href, could be target, could be whatever attribute you might think of. These are some of the attributes that every element might have into your, into your DOM page. For instance, we have element.id that allow us to read and especially write the ID of the given element. Then we have class list that is an array containing all the classes of the element. 
we know that the class is not only multiple in the sense that we can use the same class for several elements into the page, but also because a single element can have multiple classes. And therefore, it's pretty straightforward that class list will be an array and because it could be, have zero element or 10 elements, we will never know. Style, as we've seen before, is an object that contains the inline styling of the object. Now I will show you that when I change the style property in Chrome, we can really see that property being added to the element style and to the DOM itself. Or for instance, another very important one is inner HTML that allow us to read and write the HTML code within the contain uh, the, the current element. So if the element has 10 children, we will be able to erase them, add another children, modify it, and so on and so forth. Or in a text that will give us back just the text without all the tags, angular brackets, tag names, and so on and so forth. So let's make an example. So the first thing that I promised you was to be able, since we have this HP cover, for instance, to set the style of width equal to 100%, for instance. And as you can see, now the picture is as large as the container, okay? How has this happened? As you can see here, we have now this inline styling that is not there in my page. So I added it dynamically, okay? And let's make another example. So suppose that I take a reference to this UL. So I can go back to my console. So um, let my list be equal to document query selector UL. My list dot inner HTML, as you can see, contains exactly what we expect to see there that are all the tags that compose the list. What happens if I just erase the content? As you can see, now all the children are gone until I refresh the page again. Awesome. Okay, so do you have any question on this part before we move on with the Evan listeners? Is pretty clear something it's not? No, there is no way to change the, to save these changes. So it's a good practice to test it out on the browser just for the experiment, but then you have to remember that you have to take those changes to your code. Otherwise, they're simply lost, okay? Uh, what are you doing in the console? Would I write the same way in VS Code? More or less. So what we are doing here, we're changing the page at the runtime. Usually what you want to do with JavaScript is to change things when something happens, okay? Because otherwise it would make no sense. You can just write your HTML code as you, as you like it without having to change it later with JavaScript. So now that we know how to play a little with the DOM elements with JavaScript, we will see how we can react to events in order to change our page accordingly, uh, reacting to a specific event triggered by the user, okay? Or by the page lifecycle to be frank. So first thing to, inter oh wait, another one. Uh, would you please change the background of one of the LI in the UL by JS? Sure thing. So let me just go back here, reload the page. Uh, let me just, so we have to take one of the LIs inside of the UL and I will change the background. Awesome. So I will do it with one, with one line of code document query selector all I will select all the LIs I will pick the third one and I will style the background back 
brown as red. And as you can see, the third element has been that has been, you know, styled as we ask JavaScript to. Any other question? Okay, cool. Okay, but how can we intercept the user behavior? Let's introduce the concept of event listener. Event listener, uh, event listener is a function that fires when an event occurs. Okay, so events can be anything from a click to a mouse entering the content area or an image downloading finished or things like that. There are many ways to create them. We already seen once, one, one way, okay? So the list of event is impressive. So let's just take a simple look to this list. As you can see, there are many, 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 many events, okay? So there are many events. And I think I used in my, I don't know, 20 years experience web development thing, 20 of them, not the whole bunch of 500 or whatever they are, okay? So you don't have to learn all of them. Some of them refer to the page life cycle. What does it mean? Some of them are not related to the user behavior, but they are triggered automatically by the page when something happens. A simple example of it is when the page loads, when the page is ready to execute with every CSS is in it, when every JavaScript is in it and so on and so forth, some events are triggered. Why this is useful? Because maybe you want to load some information when the page uh, loading is finished and things like that. So during the usage of our web app, some events are triggered. This event goes under the name of page lifecycle events. We can use this to execute arbitrary code. Mostly, uh, we are going to use the onload that is triggered when the page is ready. So window onload function something. Let's make an example. Let's go back here. I promise that later we will do something more meaningful with this. So script window onload and here I will define it with the arrow function syntax. Please bear with me. This is completely equal as window onload equal to function and that's it. They are brother and sister, the same thing. And here I will just console log page loading. Here we go. Let me just refresh the page and check in my here we go. As you can see here, we have the page loaded in the midst of all these very boring and annoying messages from Ethereum and things like that, okay? Awesome. Let's continue our journey into these events and later we will see why those events matters and how we can use it. So some of the events can be specified directly into the HTML code. For instance, as we did uh, yesterday, uh, two days ago, button on click, console log, hello. This is pretty straightforward. We're adding an attribute on click and the value of that attribute is JavaScript code. In this case, console.log, it could be invoking a function. It could be removing the very same element. It could be whatever code that you like. And this is okay for the static part of your application. If you know that you're building a part of your application that will never change, like the login logout button, there is no reason not to use this on click directly there. But for the, the dynamic part of your application, we will introduce another concept. So let's try to add an on click event here on the image on click. I don't know alert uh, alert let me think about it let me close this 
let me just Avada Kedabra. I think it was something like this. So if I go back to my page and I click on Harry Potter, as you can see, the page kind of kills me. Okay. Pretty straightforward. The code that I put here is executed. Could be any piece of JavaScript code that you like. Another way that we can use to add events is add event listener. We can use add event listener to add an event listener to any element on our page. Dot add event listener, event name and callback is the way to define it. The event name, for instance, for click is click, for mouse down is mouse down, and so on and so forth. You can refer to the full list we've seen before. As an example, if I have a button like the button submit, I can add an event listener of click, and the callback is just a function like console log clicked. And this is okay for every part of the application because maybe that button was not there when the page has been created, but this is the result of another or of another operation that the that the, um, that the customer the user went through. Okay, let's make an example, and this example will be a little more tricky, but I hope a little more fun. So let's add. Let's try to add an event listener to all these tasks here. So let me just transform this in tasks like, I don't know, uh, grocery. And then, I don't know, ignite lecturer. And then maybe we're gonna have, I don't know, dog something. I don't have a dog, but this is probably something people do. And I don't know, uh, pay the bills. and order something stupid from Amazon. Okay, so suppose that this is my checklist for the day and I want to be able to uh, click on those elements and just, you know, check them out when, I, when I'm done with them. How can I do this? Well, I can just go back to my page on load and select all of them. So let me just write it down in English. So I need to select all the list items in my list. For each one of them, I need to add an event listener for the click event. When I click on them, I want to add a new class that will make them look as, uh, I don't know, underlined or uh, striked. I don't know the right word for this probably. Okay, so let's transform this into code. So first and foremost, I need to get all the list items. So list items will be equal to document, query selector all, because we will select all of them, and the class here is list item. So as you can see, I'm selecting all of them. I will get back an array with these five elements. How can I iterate over them? I can use the for. For let i equals zero. i less than list items dot length i plus plus. And now what I need to do is to add the event listener. So let me just, we have seen the syntax a few minutes ago, but let's see how it works. So list item, so list items of I add event listener. And here we will specify that will be a click event listener. And then we will have our method that will, for the moment, let me do it like this, just console log clicked. Let's see if this works. Let's, let's do it by step. I'm going back here. 
I'm going to the console, I'm cleaning up everything. And if I click on Ignite Lecture, it's clicked. If I click on Pay the Bills, it's two times clicked. If I click on Order Something Stupid from Amazon, it's three times clicked. But how can I know which element has been clicked? How can I know? Uh, how can I know exactly which element has been clicked from my list? I just know that something has been clicked. Luckily, all the events in JavaScript carry with them the event object. The event object is a collection of properties, depending on the event, that stores, you know, most of the valuable information of this event. If it is a click event, it will be X and Y. If it is a, a keyboard event, it will be probably the button that has been pressed and so on and so forth. If we, this object came as a property to the function, so we can just call it event props, props, something like this. And if I console log event props, I will be able to see in my console some very relevant properties. So if I click on Ignite Lecture, as you can see, I have a lot of property here and there, but I also have the target. And the target is the reference to the element that generated that specific event. So what I can do here is just to say, okay, the clicked one, let clicked one be equal to even props dot target. And since I have a reference to that element, I can do whatever I want with him. So click one dot class list dot add, and I will add the class, I don't know, selected. Let me just add the class here. So style selected color right, just to make it simple. And if I did it right by, oh wait, click one, oh, probably uh, click one, click, oh, click one, not click one. Okay, my fault. And as you can see, by clicking on them, they're turning red. So we, uh, we managed to add an event listener that is reacting to an event and is producing some changes on the page. We will wrap this up again after the break, just to be sure that we are on the same page. And I promise that most of the theoretical concepts for today are gone. And then we will see a more meaningful example that will again, wrap up all the concepts together. So now we're gonna go for the break. So if uh, who wants to stare, will be able to, uh, to check the, the homework solution from, from yesterday. For the, one, for the other ones, just go for a coffee, a, glass of beer, whatever you like, and see you in 10 minutes. And welcome back to this second part of the lecture. So we covered uh, the events so far, and before that, we managed to access the DOM and modify most of the, uh, most of the properties uh, that we, we usually have into the DOM. We have seen that we can access the DOM with the old school, we can say, um, selectors like get element by ID, get element by class name, get elements by tag name, and so on and so forth, or by query selector and query selector alls. All that receive a selectors like the ones that we use in CSS and returns us a single element, the query selector, or an array, query selector all. So this is a list of the important events that we usually handle with JavaScript. Focus is when the elements receive the focus. So when you click in a check, when you click in a text box, for instance, that gives him the focus. Blur the other way around. So the element lose the focus. This is a kind of the event that you use when you when you want to check the validation of a field. So suppose that you have a text field that should contain an email. And when the element, element blur, maybe you check if it's a valid email or not, okay? Scroll is when the element is being scrolled. For instance, you can use it on the document to see if the user is scrolling the page 
or you can use it in a sub element to see if the user is crawling in that specific element. Or you have cut, copy and paste that are kind of self-explanatory. You have key down, key up and key press that reacts to the keyboard. The thing that changed here is the moment in which these events appear. Key down is when you press the button, but is before the content of that element changes. So if we're talking of a text box, a text area and input in general, key down is when the value of that element hasn't been affected yet. So for instance, if you want to prevent for some reason to input the, le the letter Z because everybody hates the letter Z, you can intervene here in the key down and prevent the letter Z to be added to the content of that, um, of that specific um, input text. Key up is when it's too late. So you can do it when the, 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 the update has been made and key pressed the same thing, okay? There is also others like mouse over that is triggered when you over with the mouse over one element or mouse enter that is triggered when you enter with the mouse on an element and mouse leave that does the exact same thing. Animation start and animation end refers to the CSS animation. So if you want something to happen when an animation is finished, you can use this. And of course, there is a full list of them. And these are the kind of event. I mentioned before that there is an object that is generated when the event is triggered. And this is the very same object we use to change the color to a specific element. These are the kind of objects that are, that are there. So the event that we had before was a mouse event. And since it is a mouse event, it have with him some properties that are proper to the mouse event. Let me just do one single thing here. Just one sec, sorry. Because I'm distracting from the notification. Okay, awesome. So let's see a simple example. Let's go back to our page. And let's just do it as simple as possible. As we added this on click on this book, we can also have on mouse enter. Was it on mouse enter? Console log mouse in. Or on, wait, yeah, it's correct. On mouse out. Console log mouse out. I think it might have been mouse in. Let me see. And here we go. So let me see if this works. Mouse in and mouse out. As you can see, in the very moment in which I go in and out, the event is triggered. And this could be used for several circumstances. Could be for giving some visual effect to the card without using CSS. Could be for uh, make it as escape if we're talking about building a video game and things like that. So there are many things that you can do just with these events. Please let me remove it because otherwise it might be messy. Okay, let me remove the whole bunch of it and let's give it back his own dignity to our Harry Potter. Of course, as mentioned before, we can also using JavaScript to create DOM elements, to create part of the page. And for the moment, we just created elements using inner HTML. If you remember, we used it on Wednesday and also tonight we use it to delete elements by assigning an empty string to it. We can create a DOM element programmatically using create element and specifying the tag name between the parentheses. So for instance, we can just create a new div with the name that we like with document create element and specify between double quotes, the type of tag that we want to create. Once the element is created, 
we can set its own attribute, classes, and style. The element will not appear until we add him to the DOM. How can we add DOM elements? The, to add a newly created DOM elements on the page, we need to append it to the DOM. And of course, you have to specify where. So you created a new button and you have to specify where this button should appear into the page. We can append DOM elements programmatically using the append child method. So this is a complete example. So let parent will be document query select on my parent div. So we have the selector for the parent. We create my div using the create element. We specify a class that we like. We specify the text that we want, and then we can just append it to the parent. Until this moment, the element is not there. Let's make an example. Let's make a meaningful one. So let's go back to our page. Let's just create a new button here with add new li. And let me just add an on click here that will refer to a function that I will call add list item. Let me just go back to my index.js and create this function. So function add list item. So the things that we have to do is first and foremost, we need to create this element. So let new list item will be equal to document create element li. Then I want to specify the class of this list item. I want it to be the same of the, the same element of the other one. So I need to spec to add this class. We, we have seen how to do it. New list item, class list dot add list item. Last but not least, I want to set a text. New list item dot inner text will be equal to newly created list item. This element will not appear into the page until we attach it, we stitch it somewhere into the page. So we can just take the, the, unique, the unique list that we have on the page. So it would be let ul equal to document query selector ul. And I can just ask the ul to append a child named new list item. Let's see what happens. So first, create element. Second, add class. Third, setting text. Fourth, searching for the right parent. And then fifth, adding to the page. Let's see what happens. We have this button here. When I click on it, as you can see, a new element into the list appears automatically. Of course, all the elements look the same. It's not the best thing you have seen tonight, I hope. But still, it's something fancy. Can I also add a new div uh, there where the user focused an element for? Of course you can. You can execute arbitrary code where, where an event is triggered. And therefore, you can do whatever you want. You can also delete all the elements from the page if it's what you're looking for. So we're almost done with the slides so that then we can build an example together. There is one thing worth mentioning that uh, I don't know if it was evident here, but you know, this element had this property that allowed us to you know, make them red when we click them. But of course, 
this was not out of the box for the new ones that I created. Okay, so how should we manage the newly created elements? Using create elements, it's easy to add even listener when we create this element. We just need to use the add event listener for the newly created element. So for instance, for this element that we just created, the only thing to do is to add the very same method that we created here. So we can just, in this case, copy this code. And here that we already have the reference to the element, the only thing I need to do is new list item and then add the element listener. And as you can see now, if I go here and I create a new list item. Now, also these list items react to my very same behavior. Okay. Okay. So, as I was mentioning before, very briefly, this event has an interface. What does it mean? That they share the same structure amongst different kind of interface. Every time we trigger an event, this parameter is passed to our function. This param contain all the information related to the event. And uh, every type of event has its own properties. For instance, the click has information about the X and Y where the user clicked that might be useful. Imagine that you are creating a first person shooter into the, into the browser. You need to know where the user clicked to know if it hit the target or not. Key down, information about the, the, the key that has been pressed. Uh, apart from the, the button that has been pressed, I would know also if there are some uh, moderator on it, like the shift, control, alt, and so on and so forth. And there are many of them. And the whole list is here. We can see it later. Uh, you can see it later. And I will share this, this slide with you. And um, of course, every time a new uh, event is triggered, this new parameter is passed to the function. And to catch this parameter, we have to set up the function for receiving it. So as I was mentioning before, you have to set here this name that is arbitrary, could be E, could be event, could be your name, just use something meaningful. Or of course, if you want, you can use you can create your own function and then pass the function there as a second parameter for the callback. Even if we have different objects, uh, depending on the event that we triggered, we have a common interface for all the events. Some of the property they, they share are event.target. This is the one that we used before. That is the, rev the reference to the event, to the, to the target that generated the events initially. Then we have current target that is a reference to the currently registered target for the event. Event.type, that is the name of the event, case insensitive, like click and so on and so forth. Event timestamp, that is the time in which the event has been created that might be useful for some reason. So again, as you can see here, this is an interface of type mouse event that contains the target, as I was saying, the timestamp in the JavaScript format. Let me show you the timestamp too. Timestamp. This is like how JavaScript internally refers to date. You can transform this timestamp, of course, in uh, in the, the hour, minute, second, day, year, and so epoch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let me just see. So now that we knew all of this, let's create an example together that will create a real page for us. So let's go back to our page. Let's clear some of the clutter that we have here. Let me start a new page. That will be easier. Let's call it bookstore.html. I can just create my bare minimum interface 
I will create the diff with the ID of library. And I will add here a title with welcome to my bookstore. Something like this. Okay. Now, let me just add some script here in the very same page. And I will execute some code on window on load. I will read my books out of this list. So I will just copy this list of books that as you can see, it's just a JavaScript object and I will place it here into my page. So let books equal to this whole object. I will just close it, not to steal any space on the page. And what I want to do at this point is to read the list of books and for every book add it into a sort of card into the page. Awesome. Let's style a little this page. Let me just create everything in the same page. So let me just say that the library will have display flex and flex wrap wrap. Flex wrap allow us to take the element into a new uh, into a new line, let's say, in the moment in which they reach the, the, the maximum, especially if they have a fixed size. Otherwise, flex will force them to stay into the same row or into the same column. So I will just add some other properties here, like for my library, I want the, I'm, I will call them card to have a max width of 200 pixel and a border of one pixel solid gray and a border radius of eight pixels. I'm just throwing them up. So, and my library card image will have a max width of 190 pixels. There is a typo. Oh yeah, thank you on library. Thank you. Okay, now that I have some class, I can try to read my library. So I already have them into an object that is an array. So what I need to do is just to iterate on it, okay? But first I want to take a reference to the place where I will put them. So my library, so let library will be equal to document query selector library. I'm selecting by ID and therefore I'm using the hash. Now that I have this one, I need to create over and over these books and add them here. So read all books, I need to iterate for let i equal zero, i less than books.length i plus plus. So for each book, for every book, here we go. Let me just copy this, that is the right command. And now I need to create my book as I like it. So first and foremost, I will add this card element. It will be the parent that will contain both the cover and the title itself. So I will just create my, my card. So let card equal document create element div. To my card, I will add the class card. Inside of this card, I will have two elements, the image and the title for the moment. So I can just create my image, let image equal document create 
element image. The property that I really care about this image is the source. But where can I get the source? If I take a look on how my data is structured, I can see that there is an image property inside the books. So my current book will be, let me just create it here. Let current book will be equal to books of I. So now I can set my image source to be equal to current book dot image. And as you can see, I will just go for the first one here, for the second one here, for the third one here, and so on and so forth. Now that I did this, I can create my, I can add this to the card. So card up and child image. And then I will also add the title. So I need to create my title. So let title be equal to document create element. This will be a paragraph, for instance. I want the title dot in a text to be equal to current book dot title. And I want to add it again to my to my card. There is one step missing. Now we have everything inside the card, but the card need to be added to the library. So I just need to library up and child card. So just to recap, when the load of the page is done, when everything is set and ready to go, this will automatically execute. It will get a reference to the library. And for each and every book, it will create a card. It will add this class to the card. It will create an image and set the source. And as somebody is suggesting, I will set also the alt that will be equal to current book dot title plus, let's put it like cover, something like this. I will add the image to the card, create the title, add the title to the card, and then add in the card to the library. This will probably not look very good at the first run, but let's see if this works at least. Oh wait, I need to run it. So open with live server. And as you can see, it's loading slowly. It's not the best UI you will ever you have ever seen, nor the best book ever. But if you consider that without this, if I just return here, this code won't be executed. This is like my page without it. It's completely empty. There is nothing to see. And just by adding this piece of code, I'm dynamically generated generating a big chunk of it as you can see here it's not perfect it's far from being perfect but yeah i mean it's something that i'm generating out of this list any comment on this let me show you the code again is it clear Okay, awesome, really cool. Okay, nice. So suppose now that we want to make this book disappear when we click on them. How should we do that? Well, we know how to do it. We know that we can add Evan Listener. Evan Listener allow us to listen for a specific event and execute arbitrary code when that specific event is fired. So in this case, I can just go here and say card dot add event listener. And here I can select the type of event listener I care about. For instance, I can just use the click event and then I will have my chance to execute the code that I like. Let's call it click event. So what do you want me to do? 
when we click on a, on a book. Any suggestion? Any curiosity? Zoom in. Okay, let me think about how we can zoom in. I can make it bigger. Yeah, I can make it bigger maybe. Or I can display none. Okay, wait, we have several options here. Let me just figure out overlay with color, add paragraph, display none. Be the first in showing. Be the first in showing. That's tricky. That's definitely tricky. I like it. Let me think how can I how can I do it? Be the first thing showing. I should just hmm. That would be all already tricky. I think it would be hard to understand then. Just briefly, what you have to do in, to make it first of the list would be to swap it with the first one or unshift the collection of children and put it at the first place. It's not hard, but it's like, it's kind of complicated. It requires several steps. So let me just add a different styling for it, okay? So we have our click event. And the first thing that I want to show you is the difference between click event, between target and current target. Because maybe from the slide, it was not super clear. So click event dot target and click event. Okay, let's see the difference. Let's go back here. Let's find, let's inspect the page. And let me click on this book. Console, clear, console. Okay, awesome. Do you see the difference? This is target. This is current target. This is the image. Why is the image? And this is the card. Why is the card? So the difference is that, let me, let me try another click just to give you one more hint. If I click here, this is the paragraph and this is the card. This is still the card. So the target refer to the element that triggered the event from where everything started. So it's telling us from where, where we clicked and, and therefore we can always refer to the, to the element that generated the event. But in most of the case, we're not interested to the element that generated the event but to the element to whom we attach the event listener. And for that, we have the current target, okay? So what's the matter here? Suppose that I want to add a border to the card, regardless of where I clicked. By the current target, no matter what's the, in, the, the, the content of the card, I will always know that I'm referring to that specific card. With the target, I will be more specific but I will be more prone to errors. So in this case, I can just use the current target. Like for instance, click event dot current target dot class list dot add selected for instance. And here I can just specify that the selected class means that the border is two pixel solid red. And another thing that I want to do this, I don't like this. Let me put it 200. Let's see what happens. Oh, wait, nope, I don't want edge. Oh, wait, I think I made a mistake. Yeah, 2000, yeah, thank you. Okay. So why nothing is changing when I click on it? 
Any suggestion? We assign the class to the card. And as you can see here into the DOM, the class is there. But this rule is less specific. OK, so here we have a rule that implies an ID and a class name. Here, we just have the class name. And therefore, even if this is the new rule in town, this is stronger. And therefore, this will win. So what we can do is just to say that this selected will insist on the, on the card with selected. And now it should work. So if I go back here and I click, as you can see, we have this border that appears. How can, I, how can I make this border disappear if I click again? How would you do that? So this is the current code. Exactly, toggle. There is another method that is called toggle that will add the class if the class is not there and remove the class if the class is there. So if I go back to my page and I click on the books, as you can see, if I click again, the selection disappears. Cool. Suppose that I want to have here on top of my page, the total price of the selected books. Let's do that together. So let me just add here into my H1, another span that we know that is an inline element that we can use with maybe zero in it. And I will just add an ID of total price, something like this. Cool. So now that we have this, how we can calculate the current price. So as you can see here, we have this element. This will be super complicated actually. No, this, this will involve too many things. Sorry about this. Let me just <laughs> calculate another simpler example because it will have involved a lot of reference. But let me just create the total amount of number of selected numbers, not total price, but total selected. Cool. Now that we have these selected here, what I can do is just to update this number with the number of elements with the selected class. And this, as you will see, is super simple because what I need to do is just to take a reference to this element. So let total selected span be equal to document query selector of total selected. And then I will set, I will get all the selected elements. So let selected books be equal to document query selector all selected. And what I will do is just to set the total selected span dot inner text equal to selected books dot length. Let's see if this works. It starts at zero. I select one, it works. I click again, it goes to zero. So as you can see, we are immediately able to execute this. Not bad. Awesome. OK, cool. So do you have any question on this piece of code?
Could you explain again the click event? Sure. So every event in JavaScript is generated as a response to a specific user or page action. We have two big, two big categories, the page lifecycle events and the user generated events, if you want. The user generated event are of many type. One of the most used is the click event. We can assign a click event in several ways. We can use the on click by writing it directly into the HTML, like on click, alert, whatever, or we can assign it through the add event listener method. The add event listener method accept two parameters. The first one is the type of event he has to listen for. In the case of the click event, it will be the click. The second one is the method that will be executed, the function that is executed, the piece of code that is executed in the moment the event is triggered. Every event in JavaScript give also an uh, event interface that contains all the property of the given event. In the case of the click event, this is, a is, this is a type of a click event object that contains some extra information, not only the usual target, current target, um, times, timestamp, etc., but also properties proper to the click, like the X and Y of where the user clicked, uh, if there was like the shift pressed or not, if it was the left click or right click, and so on and so forth. In this specific case, when the click event uh, is triggered, we are doing four operation. The first one is to toggle the selected class from the element from the card, basically. The second one is to take a reference to this total selected in the title. The third one, is to select all the elements from the page that has the class selected. And the third one, to update this total with the length of the element in the array. Any other question? Sure. Every event generated provide us a target and a current target. The target always refer to the DOM element that generated the event. The current target always refer to the DOM element to whom the event listener is attached to. This could also overlap. But in case of nested element in which we have several children, the target might vary. So if we have, for instance, this structure here, as we have, for instance, for the card, the event listener is attached to the card itself. But at the end of the day, it's more likely for us to click on the image or to click on the paragraph. When the event is triggered, it will bubble from the parent to the card and the card will trap the event. At that point, the event will contain the target that will be, for instance, the paragraph that is the element that has been clicked, but it will also hold a reference to the one that captured the event that will be the current target. I think this is also visible here. As you can see, we have this this handler, if we inspect the card, as you can see, we have this event listener that has the prototype of our code, the scope, etc. Well, if we go on the paragraph, as you can see, we see also the click that came from the from the card itself. So it will bubble until it reach this card. Again, target is the element on which we click, for instance. Current target is the element that is responsible for handling that click. Any 
Exactly, Ram, exactly. So did I answer your question about, is a little more clear, Ines, about target and current target? Okay, awesome. So, any other question? Okay, awesome. So, let me go back to the slides. So, it appears we will finish early and we will have more time for Q&A. But let's see what the future holds for us. So next week, we're going to learn how to create dynamic web page, but not from a JSON file that I had on my hard drive, but from actual APIs. So we will contact external servers, we will retrieve information out of them, and we will create page that will reflect data that is stored elsewhere. So we will be able to uh, fetch information from Amazon, from uh, Facebook, from Instagram, and use those information to create your own application. And we will also, we're going to learn how to use high order function arrays. We will learn how to filter those books, how to uh, aggregate the information without getting too, too mad uh, with, with low level code. And we and we also gonna learn how to handle asynchronicity in JavaScript. So we will learn how to make things happen at one, more things happen at once without blocking the user experience and the interface. You have to consider that for the moment, we're doing things on our own computer. And this will lead us to almost null uh, response time from the computer. But in the moment in which you are talking to server that are located in the US or that you're loading a file that, I don't know, a movie from Netflix, this might actually take some time. And therefore you have to build interface that does not freeze because otherwise the user freaks out. And we will learn how to do it next week. So this is all for tonight. So I will stop the recording, but I will be available, of course, for Q&A.